Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Welcome to St. Augustine Catholic Church, the mother church of black Catholics in the nation's capital. Today we celebrate the 13th Sunday in Ordinary Time. We hope that all of you joining us in person and via live stream feel the warmth of our faith community, and we want to encourage you to participate with us to the fullest. If you're looking for a church home and would like to become part of St. Augustine's Parish, please see an usher after Mass for the registration form, or you can go to our website, staugustine-dc.org, to register. We also encourage everyone to visit our website for important updates and information about our parish. At this time, in order that our worship experience might be without distractions, we ask that you please silence your cell phones and refrain from using them during the Eucharistic celebration. We encourage you to fully participate in our Mass and join with us in singing all of our prayers and responses. There are missalettes and hymnals in your pews to assist you. Please note that Holy Communion will not be distributed from the cup, but from the host only, as Christ is fully present under both species of the Blessed Sacrament, and that the sa Blessed Sacrament must be received in the hands only. In today's readings, we are challenged to let go of the things that hold us back from devoting our lives to Christ and the invitation he has given us to carry out. Many of our daily life tasks are important and have their place, but too often we find ourselves so buried in them that we lose sight of the greater mission and purpose that our lives were meant to serve. Being disciples of Jesus Christ and missionaries to a world that so desperately needs to know the truth of the gospel and the enduring love of God. Today, let us take an honest inventory of our lives and our calendars and adjust our priorities where necessary. Let us commit to walk the path that God has laid before us and let go of those things that distract us from what matters most. Now please stand and greet those seated near you. Now please join us in our entrance hymn. Our entrance hymn is, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for he is good.
we give thanks in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the grace and the peace of God our Father and the Lord Jesus and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all. God is so good that we might would get, offer our, uh, some, uh, replace our wills with his, his, our plans with God's. But we don't always do that. And the scriptures today remind us that Jesus says, if you can't put your hand to the plow, if you keep looking back, then you're not worthy of being my disciple. For all the times that we have been distracted, that we have not had our priorities in order, let us ask God for his pardon and strength. Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God in the highest. Glory to God, glory to God, and on earth peace to God. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God in the highest. Glory to God, glory to God, and on earth these two people of good will. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, heavenly King, O oh God Almighty Father, O oh God Almighty Father, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God in the highest, glory to God, glory to God, and on earth these two people of the world, Lord Jesus Christ. Only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God in the highest, glory to God, glory to God and on earth these two people of good will. You take away the sins, sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. Glory to God, glory to God, glory Glory to God. 
Let us pray. O oh God, who through the grace of adoption chose us to be children of light, grant we pray that we may not be wrapped in the darkness of error, but always be seen to stand in the bright light of truth. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. A reading from the first book of Kings. The Lord said to Elijah, You shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat of Abel-Meholah, as prophet to succeed you. Elijah set out and came upon Elisha, son of Shaphat, as he was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen. He was following the twelfth. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak over him. Elisha left the oxen, ran after Elijah, and said, Please, let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, and I will follow you. Elijah answered, Go back. Have I done anything to you? Elisha left him, and taking the yoke of oxen, slaughtered them. He used the plowing equipment for fuel to boil their flesh and gave it to his people to eat. Then Elisha left and followed Elijah as his attendant. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. portion and my cup you it is who hold fast my lot before me with him at my right hand I shall not be disturbed For my heart and glad and my soul rejoices, my body too abides in confidence, because you will not abandon my soul to the nether world, nor will you suffer your faithful one to undergo corruption. Show me the path to life, fullness of joys in your presence, the delights at your right hand forever.
A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. Brothers and sisters, for freedom Christ has set us free. So stand firm and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. For you were called for freedom, brothers and sisters. But do not use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Rather, serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you go on biting and devouring one another, beware that you are not consumed by one another. I say then, live by the Spirit, and you will certainly not gratify the desire of the flesh. For the flesh has desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are opposed to each other, so that you may not do what you want. But if you are guided by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. When the days for Jesus' being taken up were fulfilled, he resolutely determined to journey to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On the way, they entered a Samaritan village to prepare for his reception there, but they would not welcome him because the destiny of his journey was Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they journeyed to another village. As they were proceeding on their journey, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus answered him, 
Foxes have dens, and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. And to another he said, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. But he answered him, Let the dead bury their dead. But you, Go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And to another, and another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to my family at home. To him, Jesus said, No one who sets a hand to the plow and looks to what was left behind is fit for the kingdom of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. No one who sets his hand to the plow and looks to what was left behind is fit for the kingdom of God. Whatever path, whatever path we were walking, it was different than the path of a disciple. Whatever our priorities were that were different than that of a committed disciple, all that was we had to leave behind. Because Remember, Jesus is not just a savior to be worshiped. Jesus literally defined himself as a path to be followed. He didn't just say, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Son of God. He said, I'm the way, I'm the path, I'm the direction to go. And so to sincerely embrace our identity as disciples of Christ, it means the willingness and the decision to walk the path he's laid out for us. He describes the Christian life as not simply, again, believing in him, but also in the gospel that he preached. The good news, the word gospel literally means good news. We all like good news. We're often overwhelmed with bad news. Oftentimes we, we meditate more on the bad news than on the good news. We talk about the bad news more than the good news. We focus on the bad news more than the good news. As a matter of fact, we literally will say, the news is so bad, I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to get to church. I don't have time. I'm too overwhelmed. I'm, I'm too depressed. I'm too anxious. I'm too angry. And you know, I mean, I don't have time for the good news. And yet that's what we need more than anything. And that's exactly what we're called to share and nothing else, the good news. The work of building God's kingdom is serious business. If you are a baptized believer, nothing should matter to you more because nothing seemed to matter more to, than, to Jesus than that. Jesus talked about loving our neighbor. Jesus talked about you know, the, uh, uh, taking care of the poor. He talked about many things. But more than anything, if you read the four Gospels, he talked about the kingdom of God. And every else, everything else he talked about ultimately was an expression of the kingdom of God. Well, the word kingdom of God, it means it's not so much, again, just the, uh, you know, the idea of a, a, a kingdom, like a palace, obviously. Replace the word kingdom with reign, the reign of God. You see, if God is not reigning in your life, something else is. Something else is, someone else is, because... Each of our hearts has a throne room, and somebody's going to occupy that seat. It might be me, it might be somebody else. But the one that rightfully has a place there is God. So to let you remember, if, if, so the key is to, to embrace the kingdom of God. Remember, first of all, how does God establish his kingdom on earth, on earth as it is in heaven? I'll tell you how he does it, one heart at a time. And the one heart that I am most responsible for to allowing him to reign is my heart. It's the one heart I, I, uh, that I can, I can decide whether that'll happen. 
his kingdom. Because when Christ reigns, love reigns. When Christ doesn't reign, fear reigns. When Christ reigns, truth reigns. When, when Christ doesn't reign, falsehoods, lies, conspiracy theories reign. Confusion reigns. When Christ reigns, clarity. When something else reigns, confusion. When Christ reigns, justice reigns. When, when Christ is not reigning, injustice reigns. God establishes his kingdom one heart at a time. When we choose, each of us choose to say, Lord, your kingdom come in me. Your will be done through me on earth as it is in heaven. And that's why even just one heart, God can do amazing things with just one heart. But that is what's required. We have a choice to let him reign. Let love reign so fear doesn't reign. Let truth reign so falsehood doesn't reign. Let peace reign so violence doesn't reign. Let light reign so darkness doesn't reign. And that's why Jesus is so emphatic. There's nothing more important than making yourself available to God and his mission of establishing his kingdom on earth, beginning with me, beginning with your family, beginning with your children. This does not happen by accident. It's something intentional when you introduce your children to Christ and his gospel and to prayer and to the relationship, which is the heart of Christianity, a relationship. Christianity or religion without relationship is rites and rituals that do not have the power to save you, heal you, deliver you, strengthen you, empower you. It's the relationship, and nothing replaces it. So it's not enough to simply learn about Christ or learn about our faith. It's to live it. It's to come to know Christ that I can talk to every day. It's to deepen that relationship. That's the focus. What happens when we lose focus of this primary mission and become preoccupied with, we become preoccupied with secondary concerns or with what we left behind. You see, for those who have journeyed, begun this journey, sometimes in the journey, again, we face obstacles, we face challenges, we face adversity, and we can sometimes look back and say, I remember when. If you remember the story of the Exodus when, you know, after they were delivered from the, the slavery in Egypt, it says that, you know, after, you know, a long time in that desert, it was hot and they were tired of, you know, uh, the food and, and they started to reminisce. Man, even in, man, you know, uh, uh, slavery was, you know, I admit it wasn't that great, but man, at least we had food to eat. We had a meal every day. It wasn't so bad, it seems. How quickly we forget. But they were looking back, feeling that maybe God was not still with them. Maybe God was not keeping his promise to journey with them. To look back to secondary concerns is kind of like when it comes to the kingdom of God, it's like the same thing as like what happens when you text or drive at the same time. You know what you're supposed to be focused on. You know what matters the most? The road in front of you. And nonetheless, the temptation to text is there. And you end up in a mess, off the road, in a ditch, rear-ending a, a car in front of you, or worse. Clearly there are times when you can't afford to lose focus. Doing the work of the kingdom, of building the kingdom, is one of those times. That's why, again, Jesus was so strong in his words. But he often did that in other places. We've heard scriptures where Jesus would say, if, if your hand is your trouble, cut it off. Better to go to heaven with one hand than to risk the fires of Gehenna. If your eye is your problem, gouge it out. It was deliberately meant to be shocking. So the words in the gospel today, on the, first, on the one hand, we hear in the first reading that you know, Elijah puts his cloak on, on, on Elisha as a sign that he is now going to be the prophet that God's going to use. And Elisha says, well, okay, but can I go and say bye to my family? Elijah says, sure, go. Someone asked Jesus the same question. Can I go to bury my father? Let the dead bury their dead. Really? Can I, can I greet my say goodbye to my family? The one who puts their hands in the plow keeps looking back. Is not worthy of my kingdom. 
It's meant to shock. There's another passage in Scripture where Jesus says, to be my disciple, you must hate your father, mother, sister, brother, spouse, children. That got everybody's attention. Is he serious? He deliberately identifies the most, typically the most important and vital relationships in our lives. And his point is, those as important as they are, don't put them before me. You see, the reality is, if we're called to love one another as Christ loved us, the reality is, I love my spouse better when I put God first. You love your children better when you put God first. You love your neighbor better when you put God first. You love your enemy when you put God first. It's the best thing you can do. If you want to love the very best as possible way, the most complete way, the most authentic way, put God first because God is love. Put the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first his reign in your heart. If love is reigning there, you have it to share. And that's why he points out those most vital relationships, which means the most tempting things to move us away from making God the priority. Because our focus is not just making God a priority, but also making the mission a priority. What am I going to do with my life? Why am I here? What's the purpose? I know I'm here just for, I'm here for a reason, but only for a season. The reason is, in the time I have, to share the good news, to live it, to practice it. Doing that work of the kingdom. When we lose focus, we fail to carry out that mission. You know, Peter could walk on water till he lost focus. King David was a model of courage till he lost focus. Saul was an enemy of Christ till he got focused. Our Blessed Mother Mary bravely stood at the foot of the cross because she refused to allow the tragedy of her son's death to break her focus. And that's our invitation too, because tragedy will happen. Injustice happens. Pain and adversity happens. And that's why it calls us now to commit daily to be focused. The key is this, before turning your attention to the mission, what God calls us to do, we need to, send, to shift our focus to the Lord of the mission. The heart of Christianity is a relationship, and that's a relationship that empowers us and strengthens us. The letter to the Hebrews puts it this way, let us run with perseverance the race God has set before us, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. The Apostle Paul reminds us today, for freedom Christ set us free, so stand firm and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery, of sin, and instead of the yoke of slavery and sin, sin, that little word with a big eye in the middle, where the focus is me, the priority is me. Instead of submitting to the yoke of slavery, instead, put your hands to the plow of the gospel and the work of the kingdom. That's the invitation. The plow of the gospel. You know, I was looking up the word, again, what's the definition of plowing? You plow, the plow purpose of the plow is to, to turn up the land, the earth, to break up the ground before sowing the good seed. You see, if the ground is hard, even the best seed that money can buy will not bear fruit. It won't grow because it's got to penetrate that hard surface and to be able to grow into, all, into its full potential. That's also true for the seed of God's word and the word of the gospel. We can come to mass, we can listen to sermons, we can hear a great talk, we can even read the scriptures, but if our hearts are hardened, then we won't let it in. And the problem is not the seed. The problem is not the good news of the gospel. The problem is my heart and heart not letting it in. That's also true part of the challenge of preaching the gospel. If it is preached, and that's why, you know, when Jesus tells the, the, the parable of the sower, the seed, and it, it falls on all these different surfaces, it almost seems like it's like recklessly sown. It's like God is, it gives every opportunity. He's going to sow the seed where it, we, you have an opportunity to hear it and to embrace it. But if hearts are hard and it can't get through, but we must share it anyway, the good news. But why does the ground have to be broken? 
Why do hardened hearts have to be broken so that the seed can bear fruit? That is, the plowing makes the ground receptive to the seed. Sometimes it is tragedy, sometimes it is crisis that can break a hardened heart, that can either despair or say, okay, God, I'm listening now. You got my attention. And sometimes people will t- share that, you know, that, you know, I, I, that you know, I wouldn't wish what I've been through on anybody, but I can say that had that not happened, I wouldn't be where I am today in a good place. I'm closer to God because of that adversity. It broke my heart. Maybe I was betrayed. Maybe the experience of injustice. It brought me to my knees when his invitation wouldn't. When God's invitation, I easily ignored. I wouldn't let it bring me to my knees. I wouldn't let it move me to worship and to trust. I wouldn't let, I wouldn't answer the door when he knocked on the door of my heart. But sometimes it's adversity that moves us to open the door. So the plowing, the preaching of the gospel, the intent is to make the ground more receptive. Plow is also to cut into, to open up like a path to our heart. One of the best examples of one that strikes me in the New Testament is John the Baptist. John the Baptist literally was God's plow. He was called to, as as scripture from the very beginning, when he was a little child, a little baby, after his birth, his father, Zechariah, held him up and said, you, my child, should be called prophet of the most high God. You will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. Knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. And John was the one, remember, who was, was baptizing the baptism of repentance in the Jordan. And people who heard his word and let the seed penetrate their hardened hearts They actually went out to him and they acknowledged their sins and their need of God. But the same scriptures also tell us in Luke chapter 7 that, in fact, but the the Pharisees and the scribes refused the baptism of John and in doing so defeated God's plan in their regard. Look it up, Luke 7. What tragic words defeated God's plan in their regard? What's God's plan? Salvation through forgiveness. So only when we're effective in opening hearts that are willing to be open will the message penetrate and bring about God's plan. John plowed, again, remember he said, let let every valley be filled, every mountain and hill be made low. Make the rough places smooth and the crooked places straight. Give God an easy route to your heart. You know, when, you know, if, if an emperor or it was, was coming, the, the word got out, you know, that he's coming to town next month. And on his journey, there were like craters and hills that go around and all kinds of obstacles. They say, did anybody tell you I was coming? Did you prepare for my arrival? You made it so hard to get to you. And sometimes we do. Sometimes we choose the distractions. I don't have time to pray. I'm focused on this, I'm focused on that. I don't, it's like I'm not letting, I can't let him, I'm not opening a path to let him in. You see, those Pharisees and scribes, because of their pride, and they wouldn't let John's word break their pride, and so they weren't, they were too proud to ask for forgiveness. That hardened heart would not break. It takes humility to ask for forgiveness. John's word humbled some to acknowledge God and his ways and his will and his kingdom. I mention John because as one also sent by God, we, the church, have the same mission. That's who we are. We are Christ's body. I mean, that literally means that the body of Christ is not just a symbolic idea. The fact that Scripture defines us as a body of Christ means that, that literally, again, our hands aren't just our hands anymore. They're his hands, Christ's hands to do his work. Our hearts is not just share our heart with others, it's share Christ's heart with others. Your voice is not just your voice anymore. It has been consecrated when you're baptized to God so that God can speak through you. Every Sunday we hear, you know, two of our lectors say the word of the Lord. Really? Sounds like you. Yeah, he used my voice. I offered it to him. Lord, you can use my voice. You can use my hands. You can use 
my life. That's who we are, that's our call. But as church, as the body of Christ, and committed to the mission, to plow, remember, what's the purpose of plowing? It's to make hardened hearts more receptive to the good news of the gospel. We need to lead with love and mercy. We have to. Because only when people know you genuinely love and care will, they, you, will you get a hearing. Speak the truth in love, the letter to the Ephesians says. It's a mandate. It's not an option. If the truth simply comes as a club over your head, you're not going to change any heart. And nobody's going to believe you really care. So love, when I say leading with love and mercy, it's more than just, uh, just when I say love, it's, it's, it's also empathy and compassion. Empathy, I said, not sympathy for the plight of others and the pain of others and the fear of others and the anger of others. Anger is a natural response to injustice, real or perceived. If I think you're doing me wrong, I'm going to be mad, even if you're not. But what's the difference? Empathy, sympathy is more again, the, the, involves understanding from your own perspective somebody's plight. Yeah, I heard about what they went through. That sounds pretty bad. I can imagine what that's like. Can you? You think you can, but if you want to know, you got to go beyond sympathy to empathy. Empathy involves putting yourself in the other person's shoes understanding why they are so angry or so afraid, even terrified of what the future will bring. The only way to have empathy, I have to listen and hear your story and find out why you're so afraid. But God's love doesn't stop there. There's an even more radical step than empathy, and that is compassion. And if we are be, to be the plows that God called us to be in order to help people in their heart and hearts, that might make their hearts more accessible to the good news of the truth of the seed of God's word, then we have to go beyond empathy to compassion. Compassion is something very specific. You know, people say, you know, our, our God is a compassionate God. Well, what do you mean? Well, God loves us. God is kind. God is merciful. God cares. Compassion says more than that. Literally, compassion means to suffer with. It's like empathy in action. See, I can have empathy for you sitting in a chair in front of you and letting you tell me your story and, and, and feel a real sense of, of grief or pain. I, I can, in a sense, feel it but, or understanding, but still do nothing. Compassion is like empathy in action from having understanding of your plight and your genuine fear to being motivated and moved to do all I can to relieve your suffering or mitigate, if not remove, the cause of your fears. Even at the risk of exposing myself to the pain you're going through. Clearly, you can't look at a crucifix, you can't pray the stages of the cross without knowing that God is a God of compassion. He was willing to go further than listening and caring in his heart. He came, he entered into our situation. God so loved the world in compassion. He left the throne of heaven and came into the midst of our suffering and experienced himself. Alienation, fear, he sweat blood. Have you ever done that? Have you been that stressed? where the blood in your body came through the pore, your sweat glands, that's pretty intense. He knows what we go through, and he cares. But saying that is not enough. He did something. We have to be willing to care enough and to go far enough to even risk experiencing the pain, because ultimately, that is the ultimate proof that we care. And that is what we're called to do but I said we need to lead with love. Speak the truth in love. So the truth that God loves all of us. 
No matter what you're going through, no matter where you are, God, God loves you with an everlasting love. He always has. He always will. We need to tell the truth and stick with the truth of his enduring love for us. That it's a love that he's had for us from the moment we were conceived. When we celebrated the birth of John the Baptist, which happened to be my first mass, and unlike the tradition of many first mass and priests do their first mass, they have someone else preach, and I, I, I preached. I still can hear the words of Isaiah that talks about how God called Isaiah, you know, from the womb, and, and then hearing John the Baptist, his birth of John the Baptist, how God called him from the womb, and how when, when Mary uh, visited Elizabeth with, with John inside, it says, and, and the infant in her womb leapt for joy. And then the psalm for that day was also Psalm 139, my mother's favorite psalm. You're beautifully, wonderfully made. I knit you in your mother's womb. I mean, it's so clear. But the point is this, God loved you then, every single one of you, with an enduring love. He loved you every moment of your existence. He loves everybody. And we must tell them. Whatever the cost, whatever the price, but that we have to not just tell them, but show them. Because scripture says, perfect love casts out fear. People are afraid. People are afraid because when it comes to human beings interacting with human beings, there's something called man's inhumanity to man. We have a tendency not to love, but to exploit and to abuse and to use. And as long as there's a risk of that and the fear of that, it's like, I gotta protect myself. I have to do whatever I have to do. I can't trust what others will do. Folks are scared. And we need to have empathy. And we need to have compassion. Empathy to understand, but also compassion to even experience, to be willing to put our own lives on the line. That's what God did. That's what Jesus did. And we must be his witnesses. But God loves you. God always has. He loved Isaiah. He loved John the Baptist from the moment of conception. And that is a truth that could make us free if we let it. But the only way we're going to have credibility is to be willing to show compassion, the willingness to suffer with, the willingness to, to do whatever we can to support our sisters and brothers, especially our sisters to be there to provide every form of care, to overwhelm those who are afraid with a love and a compassion and a care and a service that would make them say, I, I can't believe you guys care this much. We have to do both because we're gonna affirm the sanctity of life at every stage that of your life, not just future lives, your life. And the, great, and the, the, the enduring love of God for you from the very beginning then we have to serve and we have to care and we have to do what needs to be done to mitigate the fear of being left alone. The reality is it's always been, it's still true today. In many cases, in many times, childbirth is literally to risk your life, to put your life on the line. And yeah, that's what God calls us to do. That's heroic. And who of us has not failed at being heroic in our faith? Who of us has not failed at being heroic in our love? But that's what we're called to do. But sometimes we shrink from that and say, I I'm scared. I can't. We got to be there. Because the gospel, remember, Jesus is not, the gospel is not just words. God told the word, world that he came into our midst. And it is love in action. And that is our call. So just as when Jesus was traveling with his disciples, he was going to Jerusalem, but he decided to pass through Samaria, you know, the age-old enemies, the rival between Samaritans and Jews, they would not welcome him. They found out where he was going, they, would, they rejected him. 
Think Jesus stopped loving, caring? No, he didn't. You know, the disciples thought, well, the heck with them. It's like, you know, Jesus, can we call down fire from heaven? How dare they show that disrespect to you? How dare they treat you that way? Let's fight them. Let's punish them. Let's tell them, let's share how, how evil and horrible they are. And Jesus rebuked them. That's not my way. You show them that God's love for them is unconditional. It doesn't stop because you won't accept it. It doesn't stop because you may not believe it. It doesn't stop. You must show them that no matter what they do, no matter where they are, God can reach them and wants to reach them. So we must not take our hands off the plow and look back. We must plow on and plow ahead with truth, with love, with empathy, and compassion. Let us now together profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We know that God walks with us and with all those in need. Let us turn to the Lord with our needs and the needs of people around the world. Our response is, Loving God, hear our prayer. God, hear our prayer. For the church around the world, that we may heed the command of Jesus to follow him without delay in doing the work of justice, especially in service to the poor and the most vulnerable and the neglected in our society. We pray to the Lord. Loving God, hear our prayer. For the United States of America, in this time of growing division, polarization, political and moral corruption, and loss of integrity among elected officials, may the efforts to keep our leaders accountable be successful, and may the rights of the most vulnerable and at risk in our society always be protected, especially the rights of women and unborn children in need of their care and protection. We pray to the Lord. Loving God, hear our prayer. For all migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, and others displaced from their home countries by violence, injustice, and chaos, may their pursuit of shelter and safety be matched by our willingness to extend compassion and assistance. We pray to the Lord. Loving God, hear our prayer for peace among nations, especially for an end to the war between Russia and Ukraine, for peace in our nation, and an end to the epidemic of gun violence and mass shootings. May national and international efforts to bring about peace prevail, and may lawmakers do what is right and just 
to make our society safer. We pray to the Lord. Loving God, hear our prayer. For our homeless brothers and sisters, that they may be protected from the dangers of living without shelter, and may our advocacy efforts result in a more safe and affordable housing. We pray to the Lord. Loving God, hear our prayer. For those who were ordained as priests and deacons this month, may they always depend on God's grace to love and serve God's people without fear or reservation. And for Deacon Clayton, who celebrates the 14th anniversary of his ordination to the permanent diaconate this week, may he always serve God and the people with passion and joy. We pray to the Lord. The loving God, hear our prayer. For the sick, especially John Adams and other members of our parish family, that they may receive the best of care and the ongoing support they need. We pray to the Lord. Loving God, hear our prayer. For those who have died, that they may find eternal peace in God's arms, and that those who mourn them may experience comfort and peace. We pray to the Lord. Loving God, hear our prayer. Loving God, you sent your Son to show us how to live and how to give and how to serve others. Give us the courage to imitate your son's passion for the mission of spreading the good news of the gospel far and wide until all know of your love and compassion and the salvation you've won for us through Christ our Lord. Amen. To prepare for our collections today, our first collection is always for the resources we need to carry out a mission that God has given us as a parish. And our second collection uh, today is for uh, the poor. Once again, thank you for your generosity.
Let us pray, sisters and brothers, that my sacrifice and yours be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands with the praise and glory of his name for our good and the good of all his holy church. O God, who graciously accomplishes the effects of your mysteries, grant, we pray, that the deeds by which we serve you may be worthy of these sacred gifts through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, a duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God. For you laid the foundation of the world and have arranged the changing of times and seasons. You formed man in your own image and set humanity over the whole world in all its wonder to rule in your name over all you have made and forever praise you in your mighty works through Christ our Lord. And so with the angels we praise you as in joyful celebration we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts we pray by sending down your spirit upon them like the dewfall, that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take this all of you and eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and once more giving thanks. He gave it to his disciples saying, take this all of you and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Save us, Savior of the world, by your cross and resurrection. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you've held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that, partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and Wilton, our Bishop, with the clergy and the entire people your Son has gained for you. Remember also 
our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died. In your mercy, welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles, St. Augustine, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, may we merit to be co heirs for eternal life and praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of ever. Lord, we pray from every evil, graciously great from all distress, as we wait the blessing. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. For the reception of communion, you may come forward with your masks off or on. Please remember that you can only receive the Blessed Sacrament in your hands. If you're not coming forward for communion, we welcome you to come forward for a blessing. Please indicate that you'd like to receive a blessing by crossing your arms in front of your heart. Thank you. Please join in our communion hymn, number 235, and you lead me, guide me, I surrender all.
I will go where you say go, even if I don't know who. I know you watch over me, and will supply all my needs. Oh my God, hear my Let us pray. May this divine sacrifice we have offered and received fill us with life, O Lord, we pray, so that bound to you in lasting charity, we may bear fruit that lasts forever through Christ our Lord. Please, please be seated for a few announcements. Calling all St. Augustine High School teens, uh, you're invited to attend the 2002 Catholic Youth Conference taking place from Friday, July 29th through Sunday, July 31st in Springfield, Massachusetts. The theme of the conference is Fearless. This exciting opportunity to fellowship with Catholic youth from around the country is just uh, four weeks away, so we uh, register at the earliest opportunity. The deadline for registration is July 15th. For uh, more information about registration, transportation, and costs is available uh, in our flock notes, the parish-wide email service, uh, or you can see the flyer in your bulletin, your physical bulletin today, for, for contact uh, information. Space is limited, but we hope to have hope. Uh, Half a dozen or so teens will join uh, myself and the chaperones uh, who will also be attending. Uh, a local group of uh, Catholic school graduates and uh, uh, native Washingtonian men are hosting a men's prayer breakfast uh, here at St. Augustine School on Saturday, July 16th from 10 to 12 noon. Uh, they've asked me to be the keynote speaker uh, to offer words of encouragement, inspiration, and empowerment. Uh, there's no cost to attend, but donations will be accepted. Save the date for now. Our RSVP information will be provided next week. St. Augustine Catholic Elementary School is registering children for the fall. Uh, we have children again from pre-K three and four through eighth grade. Be sure to stop by the table near the entrance of the church for more information to my left uh, and for information and literature. And also just pass the words. You may have uh, neighbors or friends who know that who may be looking for, again, a good Catholic school. So definitely steer them this way to St. Augustine. It's part of our educational series on the lives of the saints for six, saint, six for sainthood. A uh, book study on the book Black Catholics on the Road to Sainthood uh, has been conducted via Zoom. Uh, the, the second meeting, uh, first meeting was Tuesday of last week, the, so Tuesday, June 28th, and then July 5th, uh, Tuesday, July 5th, uh, there will be, uh, again, the, this Zoom uh, book, book study. Uh, the Zoom link uh, is in your, uh, uh, the flock notes email. If you're interested in supporting our Six for Sainthood education team, please contact us via the link in this week's block notes. Finally, just to recognize any first-time visitors to St. Augustine today, if you're a first-time visitor, could you stand so we can recognize you? Any first-time visitors? Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. Usher is bringing you a little uh, memento. It's your visit today. Uh, 
again, as your, as your first time visit, again, welcome to St. Augustine, and uh, we hope it will not be your last visit. If you're, if you're from out of town, again, anytime you're in town, please stop by St. Augustine. And also, um, if, uh, if you're looking for a church home, I uh, encourage you uh, to do consider our, our parish. We'd love to welcome you here. May the Lord be with you. My mighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Lord, find the Lord. With your lives. <laughs> our closing song is... <laughs> the Lord has done great things for me. Yeah.